talk about sepsis, um, and I'm gonna tilt it a little bit to sepsis in the age of COVID, because um, there are some slight changes to how I would manage it for a COVID patient versus anybody else. All right, um, so the way we diagnose it, historically, we've always used SIRS criteria. Do you know what SIRS criteria are? Yeah, so heart rate. Of what? Greater than 90. All right. Respiration rate, greater than 20. White blood cell count, greater than 12 or less than four. The other thing that goes with respiratory rate, it can be a, a low PCO2 showing that you're blowing off excessive things. And then the other thing we think about is temperature, less than 36, greater than 38. Might be 38.5 folks, not sure, technically. But hypothermia and hyperthermia, we're concerned about both of those. So we used to say if you had two of these criteria and a potential infection, you had sepsis. If then on the next step, you added some organ dysfunction, whatever that was, mental status changes, acute kidney injury, pulmonary edema, all the, any kind of end organ damage, that would take you to severe sepsis. And then um, the final step is if you had hypotension that did not respond to fluids, then you had septic shock. So we had three stages before. Now we've sort of shifted away from that and we'll talk about it a little bit more. So these are still important criteria. These can be early indicators as to when someone's getting sick. So don't let these go. Don't forget about these. These are still important things to be aware of. But in reality, we've shifted the way we evaluate for it acutely to what we call a Q-SOFA. So we used to talk about SOFA, which was a sequential organ failure assessment. And we look at all different types of organ systems and we have a graded evaluation of how much dysfunction there is and you get a certain number of points. And it's a big chart. You can't possibly keep it all in your brain. You have to dig it out and look at it. So since that's not a practical thing to do on the fly, we created a Q sofa, quick sofa. So for this, we look at a systolic blood pressure of less than 100. We look at a respiratory rate of greater than 22 and we look for mental status changes. And so now the beauty of this is that all you have to do is go to the bedside, take a blood pressure, count a respiratory rate, and talk to the person, and you know if they have two of three of these. And two of three of these and a potential infection takes you to sepsis. And if you have this, if you have mental status changes, you already have end organ dysfunction, right? So that's how we think about that now. So we sort of think about SIRS as being early indicators, how we used to really focus on it. Now we focus more on QSOFA. To truly diagnose sepsis, we do do the whole SOFA and look for a two-point change there as your indicator. However, I want you to keep in mind that these aren't the only things I want you to be looking at and checking for if you think someone might have sepsis. Can you think of some other things that you might want to look for? Kidney function. Okay, beautiful. So you would get, we call it a comprehensive metabolic panel that'll tell you liver, it'll tell you kidney, those sorts of things, whatever you call that at your hospital. What else? Looking at the heart, so EKG, troponins. Okay. What else do you want to think about? Uh, More directly so related to sepsis, what do you think So you can look at like kind of the periphery, look and see like cap refill. Okay. As far as labs go, let's talk about labs though. The main thing I want you to keep in mind is lactate. I want you to get a lactate and an ABG, and if you already did this, you should already have a CBC, right? And lactates, that's one of our criteria. One of the things we want to do in the very first hour, we want to get a lactate. And if that's greater than four, that tells us right off the bat that they have poor perfusion, probably due to their sepsis, could be something else, and so that takes us there. And that, we also want to trend over time to see if they're getting better. We want them to clear that lactate. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So keep that in mind. So those are some key things. And then as far as diagnosing the specific type of infection or thing that's causing it, what things do you want to think about there? Blood culture. Beautiful. Blood culture. Sputum culture. Sputum culture. culture. Oops. Culture. Urine culture. And then now what are we thinking about? Procalcitonin. Okay, great. Procalcitonin can be really helpful. Chest x-ray. Okay, chest x-ray, great, and COVID. Oh. Let's test for COVID while we're at it, okay? So all of these things are great. If a procalcitonin is low, that makes us think more of a viral infection. So that would actually push us more towards COVID, where if that's elevated, that makes us think more of a bacterial infection. Great points. We wanna do all this stuff, these cultures we wanna do in that first hour as well. So this is something we wanna do in that first hour. This is something we wanna do in that first hour. 
keep that stuff in mind for me, okay? All right, so now we have someone who has two of three of these. We sent off a whole bunch of labs to try to work it up. We've got this stuff pending. Now we have to decide what to do for our patient. And I break that into two different categories. For me, one of them, I call it antibiosis. So deciding what kind of antibiotics or antivirals or antifungals your patient might need. So in general, we are gonna empirically cover patients with at least one, sometimes even two, but at least one broad spectrum antibiotic directed at the bug you think they have. So in general, we start people frequently on vancomycin. So think really specifically about what organ you think is involved, what you think the problem is, treat that sort of an infection broadly. I'm not gonna comment for the purposes of today on whether you should or should not be using remdesivir, whether you should be using chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, or whether you should be using teclizumab or any of those. I feel like that's gonna change day to day right now. So I don't wanna make any recommendations to you, but just keep your looks out. Like keep looking for those test results, those tests coming out. Um, Listen to our friend, Tony Fauci, uh, to get the good data there, okay? All right, so that's key. This also has to happen in one hour. We know that for every hour we don't get antibiotics in, our mortality increases, okay? So that's the third thing we wanna do within an hour. Now we're over here to the resuscitation. How much fluid do we wanna give someone? 30 mLs per kilogram. Okay, perfect. So in general, we think about giving crystalloid solutions, balanced crystalloid solutions. So things like lactated ringers or plasma light. We wanna do those things over normal saline or over albumin. And we generally think about doing 30 milliliters per kilogram in a bolus of that. I want you to keep in mind with COVID, these patients are getting lung dysfunction. So you may want to go light on that. So if I calculated this out and one of my patients was supposed to get two liters, I might consider just giving them one liter up front to make sure I'm not dumping a whole bunch of fluid into their lungs. So that's a little bit of a way that this differs from standard surviving sepsis guidelines. All right, so we give them that. How do I know if I want to give someone more fluid or not? What their blood pressure response is. Okay, did their blood pressure respond? What else? Urine output. What else? Urine output, great turning of their heart rate. And kind of okay, so you're going to look at their heart rate, you're going to look at their blood pressure, you're going to look at their urine output. What else are you going to look at? Mental status. Okay, mental status. Any other tests you can look at? Things you can do at the bedside? Straight leg raise. Yeah, perfect. I always want you to think about doing a straight leg raise. That's as if we're giving patients a bolus of fluid because of the stuff that's in their legs is going to rush to their system without actually giving it to them. So it's a good way for us to see if they're going to benefit from more fluids or not. So straight leg raise, um, we can do IBC ultrasound here. We can do lactate. I want you to use every indicator that you can think of that's gonna help you determine if your patient can tolerate more fluid and would benefit from more fluid. But in general, that 30 cc's per kilogram or 20 maybe for our COVID patients, a little bit less than that. If this doesn't get us to our goal mean arterial blood pressure, what's our goal mean arterial blood pressure? Greater than 65. Yeah, and we have studies that tell us map of 60 to 65 is just as good or better than a map of 85. So this is plenty of mean arterial blood pressure. So we have to get them there. So if we gave them fluids and we didn't get them there, how do we get them there? Pressors. Okay, and what presser do we want to start with? Norepi. All right. So first line presser is norepi. I'm gonna put some stars there. Definitely first line's norepi. What about after that? What if I titrate someone up to 15 micrograms per minute of norepi and I still don't have their blood pressure where I want it. Vasopressin? Yeah, perfect. I would probably start vasopressin. Another option is to start epinephrine. The other thing that I want you to think about, if you have a patient who has vasopressor dependent shock, meaning you can't get these off and keep their MAP greater than 65, I want you to think about starting hydrocortisone 200 milligrams a day. And we normally do that as 50 milligrams every six hours will give you 200 a day while they're in that vasopressor dependent shock. And then you don't taper it, you don't have to do anything like that, you just stop it for that. So I just wanna reiterate, you're at the bedside, you're gonna look for a Q-sofa, two out of three of these things being abnormal, and then you think they have an infection somewhere, you're gonna get your labs and your cultures, and then you're gonna make sure you get your antibiotics in in the first hour. And then the next thing you wanna do in the first hour is you wanna do the fluid bolus, 
and oppressors. And those make up our one hour bundle for treatment of sepsis. For the for maps, do I need an art line? Oh, that's a great question. So a lot of time a lot of places you can't just have an art line because they don't have the things to hook it up and monitor an art line. If you have that, absolutely it's helpful to have an art line and you want to get one as soon as possible, but don't not start your pressors if you don't have an arterial line. If you can get your patient to the ICU, safely get an arterial line and monitor it, then do it. What about the what about putting the central line in? Yeah, great question, great question. So same deal, right? Same thing we want to think about is we want to make sure that we get the patient to a safe place. So don't not give them pressors while you're waiting for the line to go in. Get the line in as quickly as you can and give pressors, but don't not give them the pressors if you don't have the line in. So both of those things we do want, but we're not going to hold pressors until we have them. So lots of other things that are going to go into this as far as down the road. What I'm going to ask of you is make sure, please, 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 if you're starting management for septic shock, you're also having end of life conversations with the patient or the family. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Nikhil. See you next time.